Welcome to Product Mastery Now, where we simplify the seven knowledge areas for product mastery. These are the product management practices that elevate your influence and create products your customers love. They also help you prepare for your next step of your career. To see all seven, go to productmasterynow.com. I'm Chad McAllister, a product management professor, practitioner, and your host. Thanks for joining me as part of this podcast today. This, these knowledge areas, these seven knowledge areas come from PDMA, that's the Product Development and Management Association's body of knowledge. They have been curating and doing their own research on what makes product management work best since 1976. These are well-researched and curated areas for sure. They also have an annual conference that I love to be a part of. This year it is in St. Louis, Missouri. It takes place in September, and it is specifically September 14th to 17th. That's a a Saturday to Tuesday, and hope you can join. Go check it out. It's at pdma.org. If you come, please say hi. I will be doing some uh, interviews there of the speakers, as well as probably hosting some of the activities because I enjoy the conference so much. Okay, we have gone through this series on the seven knowledge areas. We have covered all seven, and I, I want to kind of do a wrap-up and some key takeaways with you. I call this the full throttle, right? So I'm using the Rapid Product Master Experience, the RPM nature of that, and I uh, use a RPM d- uh, wheel as if you, you were in a car looking at an RPM dial, and the full throttle is the last place to get to. And it's really taking advantage of all of the elements of the knowledge areas. And we've only kind of skimmed the surface, so to speak, and going through them. But we've done a good job of introducing the knowledge areas to you. Now it's time to to think about some key takeaways. And what I want to do is think about how we really develop our skills in product management and leadership. That's what the knowledge areas are intended to do, to provide you that knowledge that you need to be able to develop those skills. And I've learned a lot over the years as I've trained product managers and leaders and worked with companies training their groups of product managers and product teams about how they think about the skills that they need and the challenges that they encounter doing the work of creating products that customers love. And specifically leveraging this body of knowledge, right? From PDMA, these seven knowledge areas, what I call moving towards product mastery. When you learn these seven knowledge areas, you are well on your way for that. And it really will will elevate the work that you do as a product manager and as a product leader. And so PDMA has been this great organization for me to be a part of, to learn that information and then to bring it to others. And I do bring it to companies and individuals through a system I created, this RP, back to the dial of a RPM gauge on your car, the rapid product mastery experience in my case. And as I've talked to companies about this and then uh, delivered the system for them, this facilitated experience for organizations, I've really learned a lot about what they have looked at in terms of what's important to them as they go through these seven knowledge areas, what sticks with them as really answering the key key issues that they are, are encountering. And I've seen that across a number of different companies. And if you're just listening to this podcast, by the way, I do have a video version of this, and I'm sharing slides of some information that I'm talking about. And you can find the video version simply at YouTube by searching on Product Mastery Now. And if you want to find the full show notes of everything we discuss, we write out uh, everything we're talking about, you'll find that at productmasterynow.com slash 494. So as these companies have engaged with the content and as I've observed what kind of their key takeaways are, I've made note of that information and want to share some of those key takeaways with you as well. And really what, what I'm thinking about is the skills that we need to really accelerate the work that we do as product managers and product leaders. And I think about that as kind of the simple equation of the objectives that we have and the challenges that we're going to encounter. And the objectives that I most see uh, when I am working with organizations is that they fundamentally want to launch products that customers love, right? The, if I'm working with a product VP, that's that's the core objective of them and the organization. Also, products that meet revenue and profit expectations that align with the strategic objectives. So they are doing their the work that they need to do as product leaders to deliver on the organizational objectives. And that there's this increasing time pressure uh, to get products to market faster, right? So being able to deliver products that the market loves loves in less time. Uh, Certainly there's pressure for that. And overall meeting performance goals that the organization has. And in the face of that, there are challenges uh, that come along the way, right? Things like developing a customer focus 
as time goes on, it's easier for organizations to become a bit more insulated and look internally and uh, frankly forget about focusing on the customer. It is a recurring theme that I see both with the executive MBA students that I teach as well as in the organizations that I help with this RPM experience. Meeting the project deadlines, certainly another challenge. Lack of collaboration. They, they have incredible employees with great capabilities, but we're not getting all the synergies that we could. So the collaboration could be higher. And gaining consistency and discipline across the work they do and not seeing it vary by project to project. And certainly thinking strategically in alignment with the business needs. That needs to be forefront of everything they do. And it's helpful to understand the why behind the processes they used, uh, especially as we see employees and leaders in product change over time. Processes may be put in place. And there may be a lack of understanding over time about why uh, some of those activities exist in those processes. So ha having that deeper knowledge to understand why we do what we do is important. And building foundational skills to get everyone on the same page with each other so we can work faster together. It's easier to collaborate and we can move in the same direction together. So those objectives that we have as a product group, plus those challenges, that really tells us what the areas of skills are that we need to develop so we can deliver effectively on that. And that was the whole notion behind exploring these seven knowledge areas and, and why I built the Rapid Product Mastery Experience for individuals and organizations. And as I have observed those organizations, I've taken notes on uh, what they talk about and synthesized those into some standard areas that have come up repeatedly that would, if the organization took action on these areas, would be helpful. And they're related directly to the seven knowledge areas. So I've broken them into things that are easier to implement, things that you as an individual product manager can do. If you're a product leader, certainly easy to do. And then there's uh, some other areas I'll talk about that are a little bit harder to implement that will, cert that will take others around you to uh, get moving in the same direction together to tackle. But let's start with the easier to implement ones. And I'll go through uh, each of these in more detail. But simply, the, the first one is lead with the problem, not the solution. Second one is to start with strategy. The third one is to engage with customers. The fourth one is to share high value resources. And the fifth one is to clarify who the customer is. And again, each of these come directly from the seven knowledge areas. I'm just highlighting some, some of the reoccurring challenges that, that have come up as I've been working with organizations. So on to the first one. And this really goes to fostering an innovation culture when you want to get people more excited about innovating and about serving the customer. What's an easy way to do that? And straightforward, right? It's about leading with the problem, not the solution. Begin creating a customer focus and shifting the culture towards that innovation culture that we want by asking your people you work with, do this for yourself first, to reframe how you describe your work. And an easy way to think about this is imagine you're at a, a social activity, right? Maybe it's that dinner party, mixer time, professional networking, whatever the case is, and you meet someone new. And the typical question is, so what do you do, right? You could ask that question and th think about the normal response. Well, if I'm asked that question, well, I'm a university professor. I also help companies at times figure out how they can develop better products. And I do that primarily by teaching product managers, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it okay, if you made it through that, great. It's not particularly engaging and exciting to hear most of the time when we talk about our work that way. Instead, we want to get the other person intrigued about what we do. And we can do that by leading with the problem that we actually solve. And this is what, if you can do this for yourself as you describe your work with the people you work with, and then start getting others to do it, this really can shift the culture to be more focused on innovation, because we're more focused on the problems we solve, and the customer will become more of the focus along the way with that, uh, if we do this right. So if I'm asked, what do you do? I could respond with, well, most companies really care about the products they create, and they want to do a better job with that. They want to create products that their customers love, that create value for them. And I help them do that. And that just opens up kind of a story loop, right? Now, now hopefully you're leaning in a little bit and going, well, how, how do you do that? Tell me more about that, right? And then I could talk about my system, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of saying what your work is, say you're a software programmer and you say, well, I, I pro, I'm programming in uh, C++ these days and we've been starting to use some AI models that we're integrating with and like, okay, I, I kind of know what you're doing, but uh, open it up with the actual problem that you're on. 
right? Talk about, well, I help people improve their health by giving them better tools to understand how their body is reacting to supplements. Well, that's interesting, right? And then you can talk about, well, I do that by writing a software that helps to do the analysis of their blood work and et cetera, et cetera. Whatever the problem is that you're solving, lead with that first. And that's really important to get the organization thinking differently about we're not just a collection of skilled people with the capabilities that we have, such as, as programming or manufacturing. We're people working on a problem together, right? What's the organization about and what's the problem we're working with? So this is a simple one and I think a really big one that influences the innovation culture. Lead with the problem. Describe the problem first and not what this actual solution is, right? Be Stay focused on the problem that the customer is having and then describe your role in that if you're talking about your specific specific work that you do. Next one that comes up over and over in these groups is the need to align the work that we're doing with the strategy of the organization. And simply, the organizational strategy must influence our product strategy. And the key takeaway here is to simply understand your organizational strategy. And that sounds so simple, and it's actually so very challenging. Right? The number of times that I've had uh, product groups, uh, product managers or product teams, express uncertainty about, eh, we're not really sure what the organizational strategy is. Um, I, I couldn't name you a strategic objective off the top of my head. And then have them go talk to the appropriate VP in the organization. And the surprise that comes out of that VP about how many times are we talking about strategy? Why can't, why don't they, why don't they know these details? Really common, really, really common. And further, if I was to take the executive team and ask them to write each individually, write on a piece of paper, what is the strategy of the organization? Likely we'll see some variations in that as well. But this is the starting point, right? If you're doing product work, we want to have a clear understanding of the organizational strategy and think about that in terms of the strategic objectives of the organization right now, right? The strategy overall is what is our approach to competing in the marketplace, right? Think of playing the chess game, sitting at the chessboard. You're thinking about how do you play to win? So strategy is how are we going to win in the marketplace? How are we creating a competitive advantage? How are we serving our customers better than competitors? But that gets translated for us by the strategic objectives. So we just want to make sure we know what those strategic objectives are. And then we can start thinking about how the specific work we're doing aligns to those strategic objectives. Most likely, there's going to be some form of growing a market, expanding into a new market, increasing revenue, making use of a capability that we have that's currently underused. And those are all things that we can certainly align our product work to. So we need to understand the strategic objectives of the organization and then think about how the work we're doing supports those strategic objectives. The next area is to be customer driven. You heard this throughout the knowledge areas. You can't look at any one of the knowledge areas without hearing this message that we're developing products and services, solutions for customers because we're trying to deliver on what they need, right? What are they trying to achieve? What are they trying to accomplish? So we need to have our sights on the customer and have an understanding of what the customer does. And organizationally, one way to be customer driven is just to be aware of the insights that already exist. It's pretty common working with a group that a participant, someone in the group, a product manager usually, will provide an example of an observation or a discussion with a customer that led to understanding something new about that customer, right? An unmet need, something that they were trying to accomplish. The stimulus for an insight for us as product people for creating a, maybe a new product, improving the product that, we, that they're using now from us, creating some add-on perhaps to help them, right? This is pretty common. And we have people engaging with the customers all the time and we need to just be getting that feedback to those that are responsible for making the product better. And we have opportunities to just collaborate more effectively with those involved in doing the work with customers and with other product managers to get those insights and share them with each other. So there are insights that are already existing in the organization that are not ending up into the hands of the people that need them. And we need to just build that kind of internal professional network and recognize who are those people that are having conversations, interacting, meeting with customers, as well as with our network of other product managers in the organization to learn insights from also and share information with each other. 
And that leads me to the need for collaborating. So this is a theme that has come up in different knowledge areas. This one is more obvious from the customer that there's some interaction going on with the customer. Someone learned something important. Let's get that back into the hands that we need it, which leads to a need for better collaboration. And another form of that collaboration is to share resources that already exist inside the organization, right? We may have professional industry reports that marketing is already purchasing, other information that the organization has available on our industry, on our customers, the market, on trends that are taking place. And it's being bought and and used by someone in the organization, but not necessarily making its way into the hands of product people as well. So seek out people who may have these high value resources and then share them, collaborate with uh, other product managers and share them with the people that actually need them. Another finding that has come up as we uh, work with groups is agreeing on the customer roles and really agreeing on who the customer is some of the time. And what has happened in organizations at times is people see the customer from different perspectives and that may actually include not thinking about the same customer when we just use that word customer. So it's really helpful to be much more more specific about who we mean when we say customer, because over time, an organization is serving lots of customers. And this is a place where personas can be useful, because if we actually understand who that persona represents, it's a shorthand way of referring to a customer group. But we want to clarify what we mean when we say customer. And particularly in B2B companies, there's lots of different roles in the customer buying journey, when an organization starts looking at a solution and then chooses a solution for a problem they have. And we talk about the customer and there's different types of customers in that chain of decision makers. So I've seen time wasted and errors made simply because we thought we were talking about the same customer and only later did we realize that we had different people, different customers in mind. And the work that we're doing now isn't relevant to all of them. So adding clarity about when we talk about what the customer needs, also being clear about what we mean by who that customer is, just saves some headaches and some time along the way. Okay, so that covers five, what I consider those easier to implement sort of ideas that have come out of the groups. Let's now tackle five more that can be harder to implement. And these do involve a deeper knowledge of some of those knowledge areas, uh, the seven knowledge areas. But we'll make some good connections to what we've talked about and see uh, uh, how this can help you apply it to the work that you're doing as well. So the next five will be related to portfolio management, project selection, doing more with less, managing the product lifecycle, and then finally maximize the benefit of a product process. First up, let's talk about balancing the product mix. Um, Understanding that when we are working in an organization that has more than one product or service, we're going to have a need for a portfolio and we need to be thinking about what is the right product mix to have. And that relates to properly managing a portfolio and we should have understanding of what is in place now in the organization and um, maybe even influence over time what that should be to better reflect maybe our customer, maybe our structure of the work that we're doing. There might be some things that are misaligned there. Um, there's reasons why the, the, the misalignment can happen because typically the normal product manager is not very involved in portfolio management decisions. Maybe even the product leader, the product VP may not be either. Uh, but if we can get collaboration, back to the earlier point, collaboration between these functions, we can probably bring better insights together as we work on what is the right portfolio structure. But the point is we should be aware of the portfolio structure and understand how that influences the work we're doing in our products as well. Uh, Because there's a product mix that exists and, and we should know about that. So portfolio, And when you dig into the portfolio management knowledge area, we'll see some different ways of of creating a portfolio. A top-down structure is very common and straightforward where we put together the maybe the buckets of types of projects we're going to have. Maybe those support projects, which are incrementally adding value to the work that we do right now. The new-to-us sort of of project that we haven't taken on before. The some projects that leverage new technology for us different ways to organize this portfolio, but we want to make have knowledge of what that portfolio is so then we can be aligning the projects that we work on better to that mix of things that are in the portfolio. And 
doing an analysis of the projects you have now and how they relate to the portfolio is really enlightening for a lot of people. And as I've uh, been, as I've worked with groups in the past, often the product VP will be doing this work and may just not have done this before. And I've had that come up in groups where it's enlightening to see of the projects that we have going on now, the existing products that we have and the work that's going on to those products and maybe a new product that might be developed How does that overlay across the portfolio that is currently set up? Are there clear, clean connections? And does that portfolio work well to reflect the work we're doing or vice versa? So in constructing that portfolio, and if you're looking at the slide now, this shows three possible ways of constructing a portfolio, right? So the category, the bucket approach of maybe it's a new product enhancements, those maintenance and support kind of, of products, and then a research and development projects going on. Or we could use other categories for those buckets. One, one approach would be the innovation landscape that's covered in the knowledge area, those things that are either low or high and change from technology for what we're doing now, and also existing business model or a change business model. And that gives us a, basically a two-by-two two matrix, right? The routine sort of pro- projects, the radical projects, the architectural sort of projects, or the disruptive projects. And then Three Horizons gives us another way to think about this. And if we're thinking less about time scales and more about categories of work, that would be work that is core to what we're doing now. So we're enhancing what is in place right at the moment. Next would be the, that adjacent sort of work. What could we do to create new opportunities for us in the near term? And then what is really tra- transformative? What would be uh, the work that we should be thinking about now and starting some projects on to prepare us for the changes we expect to see in the future as well. So having a knowledge of how the portfolio is constructed and some insights about how it could be perhaps modified if needed to better reflect the work that we're doing or how can we better align the work that we're doing to our portfolio can be really helpful to getting better use out of the resources that we have. Another insight that has come from these groups is working the need to work on the most important project. And this is simply a recognition that we often have too many projects going on. And so the the point here is project selection. We need a way to clearly define and communicate a criteria for evaluating and selecting product projects. All organizations have important projects to put in place, right? To enhance the products in various ways, to create new products, to generate more value for the customer, and then see that value return to the organization as well. But... We can't do everything, right? So we need a way to, that is connected back to the strategic objectives of the organization, some clear criteria to help us make decisions about which projects to select to move forward with. And we're going to have multiple projects that we can do, and we want to select the ones that are most important for the organization at this point in time, right? Those projects that are best aligned with the strategic objectives that will deliver the best value to the organization and make a difference to our customers in a meaningful way as well. Too many organizations say yes to almost everything, and when not literally, of course, but say yes to more than we can possibly get done effectively. So instead, having clear criteria to help us evaluate and select projects becomes really important. And that can help uh, in some way facilitate the discussions with the person who at any given meeting may be the loudest, most important voice in the room. And maybe decisions are often made simply based on that criteria. And as opposed to really thinking through what serves the organization in the best way to reach those strategic objectives. And we should have criteria to help us select the projects that will end up doing that for us. And this is related to another area, which I call do more with less, right? It simply means to take on fewer, but more important projects. Too many projects delay revenue and burn out employees. And I've been in organizations where employees will literally say, I work on so many projects every week, literally nothing is getting done, right? I spend my time just switching between projects and getting caught up. And by the time that happens, I am asked to go work on something else. And literally, we're not making progress on the set of projects, at least not right now. And when I ask if you feel like you have enough resources to accomplish the projects that are currently allocated, I've never got, never received the answer, yes, we have enough resources. We're, we've done a good job with this. 
right? Which brings us back to the previous point, number seven on the list here, which is to make sure we have a selection criteria for projects. But then this eighth one is recognizing this is really important that we need to spend time on the most important projects. If these are projects that increase our revenue, then we want to get those out into the market as soon as we can, right? In one organization, their average time for a, a product project was about 18 months, right? And what that meant was if I had a relatively minor project that was an incremental update to an uh, existing product, uh, something that could be relatively easily deployed, a, a software project, and this was, was a software company, that could have been done in two weeks and making its way out in, into the marketplace, that project would take at least six months because the normal cadence had grown into this 18-month sort of cadence. Instead, if we look through that project list and identified maybe the top two projects that deliver the most revenue, and we sp focused on them and got those out into the marketplace in not the two years that they probably would have taken, but in two months, think about the change that makes to the organization. And, and we need to be more judicious with where we put our resources and focus on those things that deliver the most value to the customer and to the organization in the in the wisest amount of time, right? And strive to make that time less by focusing on fewer projects, doing projects that are more important. And that does relate to an understanding of where you are in the product life cycle with each of those products. As we are constructing projects to work on those products, we want to make sure we understand where that product is in its life cycle. And so this is understanding life cycle management. And that's that notion of where are where is a product today in, across that uh, life cycle. We first introduce a product to the marketplace. Then we hope to see growth. Uh, if we've done things well, we've seen more customers coming on board. And at some point, we see competitors taking action or maybe customer preferences change, the, the, their needs change a bit, and we haven't been keeping up with those needs too well. And the sales growth slows uh, during this time. We call that maturity. We're kind of reaching the top of the market share that we will get if nothing changes in the marketplace. And then as that continues, and maybe there's competitors doing a better job than we are satisfying the needs of the customers with this, our product right now, they're out competing us, we start seeing a decline and we see sales decrease. And ultimately, we should we would be in the position of deciding to retire that product or not. And looking at our product mix, the products that we have in the marketplace, across these areas, right? Which product is just being introduced? Which products are in growth right now? Which are in maturity? Which are declining? And which are those that we know are going to reti be retired from the marketplace or recently have been? This gives us an understanding of, of what we should be working on next. And this is related to portfolio management as well, to understand that product mix and that we should have products in each one of these phases, right? Products that are, are just being introduced, product or products that are in the growth cycle, what is in maturity now, what's in decline. And as companies age, and if we haven't been innovating, if we haven't been releasing new products, and most of our products have been in maturity for some period of time and some moving into decline, and we have nothing coming in to introduction, we're going to find ourselves behind the competitors very, very quickly. And it's going to be hard to play catch up. So we want to have products that are in each phase of this life cycle, and a, a healthy organization then is introducing new products at the rate that we see products going into maturity also. Uh, so there's always new revenue sources coming on as other products are perhaps preparing for that decline. And obviously there's things that product managers and the, the uh, product marketing team can do to help uh, keep things in maturity longer and uh, delay that decline. Uh, but the point here is we need products across the life cycle phases. And then the final one that has come up with groups is that there is a process in place for developing products, for initiating that idea, getting that insight, turning that into a product concept, deciding if we're going to actually move it into development, you know, do, doing that work. So however we think about that entire process of actually going from idea to launch product, organizations have some process in place. It's often not as clear as we would like for it to be. And not everyone understands the phases of work that must be done or why they exist. So we want to have a greater understanding of that actual product development process and uh, make sure people understand why those elements are there. And 
part of this is simply clarifying what our process is and making sure people are using it, that they're not left to their own to have to come up with a process, right? That's a waste of time, but to use the process that is in place. And also, we, we need some smart people in the organization that really understands why each element of the process is there and when we can modify it, right? So many organizations would have a kind of standard stage gate process uh, that might look like a five stage gate process to take us through from the beginning scoping of the idea through development and to launch. And for some projects that are very low on risk, those five steps, that might just feel too heavy. We might not need that much risk management in place. And being aware that there are, could be some projects that could have a lighter weight process is really helpful. But the point is, we should have a process, we should understand how the process works, and we should bring that to everyone that is involved in product work so they're not reinventing the wheel or having to go research how to do this development work, how, what, how to actually do that process. So I've covered 10 elements that really addresses this issue of what are the objectives and challenges of organizations in creating better products for their customers. And these 10 areas are just the ones that come up, have come up the most frequently with product managers, with product teams as I've worked with them. If you want a list of those 10 with a little bit of explanation about each one, you can go to productmasterynow.com slash love, L-O-V-E, and that will help you find, find that information. Love simply because we're trying to create products that customers love. So productmasterynow.com slash love. And all 10 of these areas come out of the body of knowledge, the seven knowledge areas that I've been covering in this series. And you can find details on all of those in the book from PDMA. It's titled The Product Development and Management Body of Knowledge, a guidebook for product innovation, training, and certification. Wiley just published this for us. This was my work for the last year, along with two other co-authors. And I'm just delighted to have my name on this book to be part of this. I have found this body of knowledge so useful for me and the work that I do. And now providing the updated version of it to others has been really uh, personally rewarding. I'm glad to be part of that. In addition to the book, I do provide online training for this, and I provide a facilitated approach for uh, groups and organizations. That is called the Rapid Product Mastery Experience. You can get details on that at productmasterynow.com slash RPM. That's for the RPM experience. That's productmasterynow.com slash RPM. And I want to leave you with a closing quote as we do like innovation quotes around here. This is from Mae Jemison. She is an American engineer, physician, and former NASA astronaut. The quote is, don't let anyone rob you of your imagination, your creativity, or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. Uh, May has certainly done that, going through so many different uh, professions, wanting to get into space and leading the NASA mission, and then being an engineer, being a, a medical physician. As a product professional, you are in many ways the center of your organization, right? You work very cross-functionally. You have insights into so many different areas of the organization, and you're probably got into product because you are really curious about, about delivering solutions for your customer that create value for them. And so I love this quote. It reminds us to reflect on what we're doing now and what we want to be doing. And I'm hoping that you find this podcast helpful as well as you think about uh, what you want to be doing and helping you prepare for that next step of your career. If you do enjoy this podcast, I appreciate a rating on Apple or Spotify for it. And that also makes it easier for others to find this podcast as well. Thank you so much for spending time uh, with me going through the series. Next week, we get back to our normal interview format. If you want to find the series, simply go to productmasterynow.com and you'll uh, see it listed. This is episode number 494. So we finished at productmasterynow.com slash 494 with the show notes. Next week, we have a great interview for you. I think you're really going to enjoy the story about how someone nearly doubled their salary moving into a product management role and how they made that possible. And the insights from that interview also help us understand how wherever we are in our career right now, how we can do a better job getting to the next level of the career. As always, keep innovating. Thank you for listening to Product Mastery Now, where product leaders and managers gain product mastery through practical knowledge, influence, and confidence. By listening, you are becoming a product master, creating products customers love. 
Find additional resources at productmasterynow.com. Keep innovating.